At 9.30 p.m., a digital timer, originally part of a Swedish-made hot water heater, sends an electric impulse from four penlite batteries to a small steel capsule. That's the detonator, and it contains 20 grams of black powder. The detonator goes off, producing the temperature necessary to trigger the bomb. The C4 explodes, transforming itself instantaneously into a gas that travels at a velocity greater than the speed of sound. To be exact, 8,550 meters per second. The pressure cooker bursts, shattering into fragments and displacing a substantial mass of air, which turns red hot from the velocity. Shrapnel, fragments of the coat check, cement dust, and scalding air hit the elderly couple sitting at the table by the door. The first to be hit is the man, who is literally lifted into the air. For an instant, he assumes the position of a crucified man, his pelvis in contact with the table. Then his limbs are torn from their sockets and ripped from his body, while shrapnel, fragments, and dust pass through him. The shockwave continues until it hits his wife. She still has her head hanging over the table, lost in her gloomy thoughts, and she's shoved into a semi-fetal position. It's as if she were rolling backward, but with each turn, her body loses consistency. It crumbles, so to speak. Fragments of her body, her husband's body, their table, the glasses, and the bottle of Chardonnay, whose content is vaporized, are absorbed into the cloud of fragments. They hurtle into the recently married couple sitting behind the elderly couple. The young bride is the first to be hit. Her left eye socket is traversed by her elderly neighbor's dessert spoon, while her body hurtles over the table and hits her husband, who starts to slide backward while still seated in his chair as the menu in his hands starts to catch fire. But the flames haven't yet caught when the shock wave and the fruit cocktail of fragments hits the micro-components manager and his novel. The bones of the older woman's ulna and humerus pierce his chest and skull like javelins. He falls backward, grazing with what remains of the back of his head the feet of the young husband, who's continuing his backward slide across the room. The shockwave expands to the group of Japanese businessmen and the Mater D. The kinetic energy is uneven. There are differences in pressure and direction due to obstacles encountered and air resistance. Therefore, the five men are not simply lifted, but dragged in many directions at the same time as if they'd been sentenced to death by being tied to horses and drawn and quartered. Three of the Japanese lose their upper limbs. The back of the fourth businessman is ripped open from shoulder blades to tailbone, stripping the spinal cord bare. The Mater D, partly protected by the four Japanese businessmen, but taller than they, is hit in the back of the head by a chunk of cement the size of a bar of hotel soap. The chunk of cement passes through bones and soft tissue, and shoots out of his mouth. The Mater D falls forward, while the shock wave, the fragments, and the shrapnel all reach the windows and shatter them. Part of the blast disperses into the outside air, but not enough. Shrapnel, fragments, and red hot dust continue hurtling through the room. They machine gun the waiter who's waiting for the DJ to make his wisecrack. They perforate his back, reducing heart, lungs, liver, and intestine to mush. They exit from his body and riddle the face of the agent, who's still trying to remember the name of that movie he has on the tip of his tongue. They hit the DJ and his besotted friend, smashing them both into a load-bearing column. The DJ's left hand and the girl's right hand, still intertwined, are torn off and sail all the way to the four Albanian models and their chaperone arriving just before a hail of chunks of reinforced concrete. A flaming piece of the coat check room, about a foot and a half long, lodges in the spinal cord of one of the girls, just above a tattoo of two butterflies kissing and exiting through the belly button. The shock wave knocks down the group like ten pins, and the five of them slide across the dining room floor, burning from the friction. The chaperone's sternum snaps inward, crushing the muscle of his heart. While the DJ's head bends farther and farther back, snapping his cervical vertebrae, the young husband passes through what is left of a window. 
he starts to tumble to the street below at the same instant that one of the models, the one who is about to go snort another line of coke, impacts another load-bearing column, shattering her pelvis. The surface of the table where she and the others were sitting has now lifted into the air. It flies like a 65-pound frisbee. The shock waves keep spreading. While part of them are hitting the dining room, another part is wedging into the staircase. High-pressure air is shrieking like a train in a tunnel, growing scorching hot. It uproots a section of handrail, rips the plaster off the walls, and thunders down to the floor below. A bartender winds up on the floor, legs in the air, while the shaking of the walls, comparable to a magnitude five earthquake, knocks shelves and bottles to the floor, shatters the glass display cases holding the pastries, and knocks the espresso machine off the counter and onto the bartender, leaving her with six broken ribs and a fractured vertebra. The shock wave expands toward the boutique. The ceiling in one of the bathrooms collapses, taking down with it all the electrical wiring and cutting the power to the bottom floor. Mannequins and chests of drawers tumble over. The plate glass shop windows of the bar and the boutique explode outward covering the parked and standing cars in the street with shards of glass. It is atop one of those cars, a smart car, parked illegally with the running lights on. The owner is enjoying an aperitif just a short distance away, that the young husband ends his long trajectory. He slams into the car's roof with the upper part of his body. At the moment of impact, his face is almost entirely devoid of nose, lips, and eyelids. The table that has been sailing along like a frisbee also ends its flight. It's heavy, and before it's gone more than a few yards, it's lost most of its initial momentum. All that would be needed is for it to glance off one of the columns, or for a new funnel of hot air to shove it off course and render it harmless. But this isn't a day for miracles, and the frisbee continues along its trajectory unhampered. The woman with the penetrating gaze really doesn't see it at all. Though afterward, she'll feel sure that she's at least sensed it, the shadow of a hurtling object wobbling out of the corner of her eye. The table lands flat on her, pinning her to the floor, knocking her senseless and breathless. Three seconds have passed since the explosion. The roar echoes off the facades of the buildings all the way to the piazza, where it startles the pigeons. Then, the screaming starts.